talk about the second analogy of experience. Um, as, uh, as Daniel mentioned, it was like a seven pages long text in this more than 600 pages book. But it's, a, it's the most controversial text um, in the first critique in this particular realism. And well, Lewis Whiteback, once a famous Khan scholar, once said that it's a continuing scandal of philosophical scholarship that after nearly two centuries, the question was still be debated. What was Kant's answer to you? Today, we'll hopefully put an answer to this scandal. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm that modest. <laughs> so the structure of my presentation will be as follows. First, um, I will briefly explain Kant's relationship to him. Uh, which will shed some light on the significance of the second analogy argument. Then I will describe the two most popular readings of Kant's second analogy argument, namely the modest and the strong readings. After that, I will point out the textual and philosophical problems with those readings, and finally I will open my alternative interpretation of the second analogy. Before that, let's have to familiarize ourselves with the usual suspects. There's um, the our famous philosophers that we will be talking about. So there is a considerable debate about how much of Hume Kant actually read, and whether it was Hume's treatise on human nature, of human nature, of the inquiry concerning human understanding that influenced Kant most. For the present purposes, I'm not going to go into the details of this debate. We have questions about the historical aspect of you know how much of Kant read how much of you can't view and which books were more, most influential, you can ask me about that in the Q&A. All right, so um, Kant's relationship with you. We know that Kant takes you seriously. And in fact, he claims that Hume's skeptical arguments pose a significant threat for the possible documents that was a respectable body of knowledge. And um, in the Prolegomena, for example, Kant writes, since the essays of Locke and Leibniz, or rather since the rise of metaphysics as far as the history of it reaches, no event has occurred that could have been more decisive with respect to the fate of the science in metaphysics than the attack made upon it by David Hume. We also know that Kant abandons his dogmatic uh, commitments after he realizes the significance of Hume's attack. He says, well, I freely, again in the Prolegomena, I freely admit that the remembrance of David Hume was the very thing that many years ago first interrupted my dogmatic slumber. His dogmatic commitments are basically, well, you know, Kant uh, refers to rationalist uh, school of thought a bit um, uh, by calling them dogmatists generally. And it's the view that we can know metaphysical truths purely by appealing to ideas of reason. And reason independently of experience, either particular experience or experience in general, experience can know um, truths. We can know truths about the world. That's why Hume's critique is so important because after that Kant writes a book called Critique of Reason, as you know, referring to the to this dogmatic idea that reason by itself, independently of any relationship to experience, can know metaphysical truths. So it is clear that Hume is very uh, important for Kant's development, uh, Kant's critical philosophy. In fact, it is uh, the Humean problem is the catalyst of Kant's critical philosophy. What is more, Kant does not only admits that he was influenced by the Humean problem or Hume's attack, he thinks that he has a solution for it. He says in the Prolegomena that I have succeeded in the solution of the Humean problem not only in a single case, but with respect to the entire faculty of, of pure reason. And he describes the critique as the elaboration of the Humean problem in its great, greatest possible amplification. So the Humean problem seems a part of the more general problem that, that Kant solves in this book. And the Humean problem is the problem that he addresses in the second book. So how does he address that? Like this. <laughs> <laughs> By throwing the last box punch. <laughs> well, while scholars agree that Kant responds to the Humean problem in the second analogy, they disagree pretty much about everything else about the second analogy. So for example, um, there's a considerable disagreement on what the Humean problem is, 
and consequently how Khan solves it and whether it's a success, whether he has a successful solution to it. So therefore, you know, we don't really know what was Khan's answer to him was. That the scandal that goes right back, you know, that I um, that uh, talks about it still continues. In order to to know uh, to determine, to know about Kant's response to him, we need to answer these questions, at least. So first, we need to know what Kant means by human problem that he's addressing in the second analogy. And to what extent Kant in the second analogy agrees with him, we need to determine that. And what does the second analogy really establish? Once we know this, uh, the answers to these questions, we can't really know um, what was Kant's answer to him. What, uh, what is Kant's answer to him? What Kant's answer? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can't really know Kant's answer to him once we establish this, uh, the answer to these questions. All right, there are two possibilities for the first question. There are two possible answers. Um, the Humean problem can be a problem of the, is the problem of causation. Some, uh, it's a problem about the operability of the causal principle, which is a, a principle that says every event has some cause. And therefore, if the problem is the problem of causation, a success, you know, successful response to that problem solution would require an a priori demonstration of the causal principle. If by the Humean problem, Kant has the problem of induction in mind, on the other hand, which is a problem about the validity of our inductive inferences, namely inferences from particular to universal judgments, and because these judgments, you know, these inferences presuppose the principle of uniformity of nature, the successful solution to that problem would require a demonstration of the validity of the principle of uniformity of nature. So there are two possibilities. Kant can be either um, responding to the human problem of causation in the second analogy or to the problem of induction. And notice that these problems um, undermine different metaphysical pr principles. One is about the validity of the causal principle, the other is about the validity of the principle of the uniform of nature. Okay, so it's that was not a coincidence that you know, Kant's scholars are divided into two groups. And they uh, have two different <coughs> readings of the second analogy. The modest reading, which is defended by, written by Gerd Fuchtel, Graham Burke, and Hamilton, this white bag, and so on, which is a very popular reading, um, reads the second analogy <coughs> as a response to uh, the problem of causation. Therefore, the modest reading comes basically, the second analogy provides an a priori. Uh, argument for the validity of the causal principle, that every event has some cause. The strong reading, defined most forcefully by Michael Friedman and Graciela de Pierres, reveals the second analogy as a response to Hume's problem of induction. And Kant responds to this problem by showing the apparent validity of the uniform of nature, that nature is uniform, and that, the, that we are justified to think that nature resembles uh, the past. So let's get into the details a little bit of these two readings. The modest reading. What does, why is it really modest? Gerd Kuchel, um, one of the defenders of the modest reading, thinks that the second analogy proves only the ability of this general principle, but it doesn't guarantee uh, or it doesn't have any implications for the existence of particular causal laws. So particular causal laws are merely particular determinations of this general law. The general law says every event has some cause, its particular determinations, particular instances would be things like you know, um, X causes Y is a particular instance of this general causal law. And according to Buchdahl, Kant in the analogies is only concerned with establishing that there are causal relations in the world, that every event has some cause, but his argument doesn't really prove anything beyond that. It doesn't really show that there are laws, particular laws that governing, that govern particular causal relations. 
as he writes in, um, in various texts, uh, Van Kant says that the analogies give us causality. We must not think it that the general causal principle provides justification or basis for such particular causal laws or for their law likeness in general. So the argument of the second analogy doesn't justify us in believing that there are particular causal laws or that there are or that they are necessary for. The law likeness basically their necessity is not guaranteed in the second analogy. And then it says, the general principle of the second analogy cannot be intended to furnish a justification for the assumption even of law likeness in general, let alone the existence of special law, like special particular instances of these laws. And the ground of the necessity that particular causal laws expressed can therefore not be involved in the argument of the analysis of experience. So for Buchdahl, neither the existence nor the necessity of particular causal laws is guaranteed in the second analogy argument. In his modest reading, Kant agrees with him that particle causal laws are known in pre-critical induction. So I know that fire causes smoke to empirically by you know um, experiencing fire and smoke constantly conjoined together, and then um, you know uh, based on my experience of this regularity, I come up with the law, the particular law that fire causes smoke. And Hume would give a similar scenario. So in the modest reading, Kant is on the same page with Hume about the, the status of particular causal laws. There are real contingent inductive generalizations. Kant's main disagreement with Hume concerns the general causal principle, not the status of particular causal laws. So because Kant is, Kant's, main, the, Kant's main goal in the second analogy is to uh, provide a solution to the problem of causation, it's sufficient for him to just provide the justification for the general causal principle. He doesn't really need to, to show that there are particular causal laws, right? So Kant successfully, on Buchdahl's uh, account, proves the appearability of causal principle, shows that it's, a, it's not a principle that we uh, discover through experience um, of our, you know, inductively, but it's something that we must assume for in order to be able to explain our experience of advanced possible. So in a way, how the argument works is kind of more complicated. I can explain that a little, a little later. But for the present purposes, um, I'm just going to say that for Buchdahl, Kant basically in the second analogy shows that it's a, the causal principle is a priori, that, that is known prior to experience, the independent Experience. Um, <coughs> because it's a it's a precondition for the possibility of experience. Therefore, it cannot be known uh, through experience, basically. What about the strong reading? The strong reading um, is called strong because on that reading, Kant proves not only uh, the a priori validity of the causal principle, but also proves the existence of particular causal laws. So as Garcia, the theorist, and Michael Friedman put it, Kant in the second analogy maintains that when one event follows another in virtue of a causal relation, it must always follow in accordance with the rule. Moreover, the rule to which Kant is here referring is not the general causal principle, but rather a particular law connecting a given cause to a given effect, which is itself strictly universal and necessary. So Friedman and the theorists basically point out the fact that throughout the second analogy, Kant repeatedly makes reference to a rule. On their reading by a rule, Kant means a particular empirical causal law, a particular causal law, as opposed to the general law itself. In fact, the first edition formulation of the second analogy principle reads as everything that happens, begins to be, must presuppose something from which it follows in accordance with the rule. So the principle itself makes reference to a rule. And but if you read a rule to mean a particular causal law, it seems that the second analogy principle makes reference to a particular causal law. And if Kant provides a, a proof of that principle, it seems that he um, provides a proof that there are particular causal laws. Also, note that um, Kant, for Friedman, the very concept of causation 
entails the existence of part of the cause of loss. He thinks that um, to say that A causes B basically means or is equivalent to saying that A is caused by B in accordance with the particle cause law, or there is a particle cause law that connects A and B in a necessary manner. So if Kant, in the second analogy again, proves that there are causal relations that every event must have a cause, he would naturally prove um, the existence of particle cause laws because the very concept of causation makes reference to particle cause. Also, it's not only the, the existence of particular cause laws, but also their necessity is, um, is an issue. According to Friedman and the Pierres, second analogy is committed to the necessity and strict universality of particular cause law. They say, if the general causal principle is true, then according to Kant, there must also be particular cause laws, which are themselves strictly universal and necessary. So, Note that uh, that um, not only of the existence but the necessity of the particular causal laws um, is somehow, maybe even though it's not guaranteed in the second analogy, the second analogy is committed to the necessity of the particular causal laws. Okay. So why is it important for their reading to show that the second analogy argument proves this? <coughs> well, because according to the Pierce and Friedman, Kant is not interested in solving the problem of causation. Kant there wants to solve the problem of induction, the problem that requires the, um, the demonstration of the uniformity of nature. And how can Kant prove the a priori, uh, can provide an a priori conception of the uniformity of nature precisely by proving the existence of necessary and strictly universal particular cause laws. So it's important for their reading that Kant's argument proves the existence of necessary particular cause laws because otherwise Kant cannot really respond to him because the, or the human problem, which is a problem of induction of their reading. As they say, the, ana the analogies of experience provide an accurate conception of the unity and uniformity of experience, playing the role for Kant of Hume's principle of uniformity of nature. According to the analogies, we know a priori that nature in general must consist of interactive substances in space and time, governed by universally valid and necessary causal laws. And this articulated a priori conception of nature in general amounts to the knowledge that nature is in fact sufficiently uniform. The Kant thinks that he has an answer to the human problem of induction. So by showing that nature is governed by particular causal laws, Kant, on the strong reading, provides an upper conception of the uniformity of nature and thereby solves the problem of induction. Remember for the problem of induction is a problem about the validity of the uniformity of nature. How do we know that nature is uniform and that future resembles the past? We can know, according to them, if we know that nature is governed by particular causal laws. And if Kant's second analogy proves the existence of particular causal laws, voila, he solves the problem of induction. Okay, so the strong reading then situates Kant in opposition to Hume about both the state about the about the causal principle and its particular definition. So contra Hume, Kant maintains that we know the existence of particular causal laws a priori. It doesn't that look it doesn't mean that we know the individual, the nature of individual particular causal laws a priori. We can't really know that uh, fire causes smoke a priori. We would have to discover it empirically. What we can know a priori prior to experience are that there are particular causal laws out there for us to discover. Right. And that is the significant difference between Hume and Kant. For Hume, we can only know if there, you know, there are particular causal laws by you know, discovering them empirically through this inductive reasoning. But Kant thinks that we can know that there are, that they, um, 
that particles won't exist prior to discovering them. So, um, but that again does not doesn't mean that we can know the nature, particular nature of those the causal laws. On um, the strong reading, once again, contra Hume Kant thinks that particular causal laws are necessary. They are not contingent. So there is a kind of um, they have a different status than mere inductive generalizations. Mere inductive generalizations such as, um, you know, my experience tells me, my past experience tells me that the food at the student center is is bad, right? And then I generalize and say this, the food at the student center is is bad. From this past experience, I come to this um, general rule. That is a contingent fact. It, and it seems to have a different status than empirical law. Right, like the law of universal gravitation. It seems that law of universal gravitation seems to have necessity while this, the food at the student center is doesn't really have that kind of necessity. Tomorrow, suddenly, they might change the, the quality of the food while we think that the universal law of gravitation will continue to work, or, you know, uh, for <laughs> So there is a categorical difference between contingent generalizations and empirical laws. And on the strong reading, um, it is because this particular causal law, empirical law, are somehow grounded in this general causal law, namely every event is a cause. And that they are necessary. They are not mere contingent generalizations. So Kant disagrees with you not only on the status of causal principle, but also on the states of particular causal law, according to the strong reading. So here's a quick recap of the two readings. Um, the modest reading say, uh, says that the second analogy argument solves the problem of causation. The strong reading kind of says the problem of induction that is at issue. Um, the sec on the modest reading, the second analogy does not guarantee the existence of particular causal laws on the strong reading. Does guarantee the existence of particular causal laws. On the modest reading, Kant agrees with Hume that particular causal laws are merely contingent generalizations. And on the strong reading, Kant disagrees with Hume that particular causal laws are merely are merely generalizations. And on the modest reading, Kant disagrees with Hume only on the status of causal principle. While on the strong reading, Kant disagrees with Hume on the status of both the causal principle and the particular causal. Okay, so I think there are problems with both of these readings, but I'm going to focus on only one major problem that each reading um, suffer from for the sake of um, revision <coughs> for the uh, time, time, time limitations. Um, so an important problem with the modest reading is that contrary to the modest reading, I think that the second analogy guarantees the existence of particular causal laws. Remember, for the modest reading, it was just uh, uh, the, the argument didn't have any implications for the uh, existence of particular causal laws. I think Friedman and the peers are right to claim that uh, to push um, the modest reading for. Um, for accepting that Kant in the second analogy text makes reference to a rule repeatedly and it is best interpreted as a particular causal law. First of all, because it is not clear why Kant would want the second analogy principle to make reference to itself. Uh, remember, for the, in the modest reading, the rule refers to the causal principle itself. Um, and Kant Then Kant would simply be saying that every event has some cause from which it follows in accordance with this rule, with this rule. Which seems, in terms of content, is equivalent to saying that every event has some cause, right? Why would Kant add this a, in accordance with a rule if he, it seems redundant. So a rule is better interpreted as a particular causal law 
as opposed to the general cloud law. So this is one reason, for example, uh, why a rule makes it uh, is that best interpreted as a particle cause of law. Also note that it is it is a um, regular, it's a, a rule as opposed to the rule. So the a rule seems like a particular cause law, we don't know a priori yet which particular cause law that particular event is subject to, but we should look for it. If it was the rule, we could understand why you know it would refer to itself because we know what the rule is, but it's a rule. And um, and also there are passages in the in the prolegomena that I um, I have on the, on the screen here, where Kant seems to be referring to the second analogy principle again, the principle that he proves in the second analogy. He says everything that happens always previously is determined by a cause according to constant law. So again, the plural here refer, seems to suggest that these causal relations occur in accordance with particular causal laws, not in accordance with this general causal principle. So it seems that Kant acknowledges that, that there are particular causal laws out there and that if you prove the second analogy principle, you're basically committing yourself to the existence of all particular causal laws. Um, finally, um, I don't have the quote here, but in the first critique, Kant explicitly said, states that subsuming the manifold of appearances under particular causal laws is the work of understanding. Um, so in the in the modest reading, particular causal laws are um, discovered, as I said, through inductive reasoning and discovered uh, by appeal to the faculty of reason's uh, regulative principles, not by the faculty of understanding's um, uh, general laws. So the existence of particular causal laws is not guaranteed by understanding, which is uh, actually the the issue at the second analogy. In the second analogy, Kant shows that the causal principle is a a priori principle of the understanding. And it's a principle that needs to be presupposed for us to be able to even have experience of events. Uh, let alone, you know, we can't really be um, abstracting the, the, that principle from experience because we need to assume that it holds, it's valid in order for us to be able to have experience in the first place. So it's a contribution of understanding. And since that understanding um, guarantees this for particular causal law by subsuming all experience of um, manifold experiences on the particular causal laws. So all these, um, so these are the separate reasons, you know, the reasons that the the strong, in addition to the strong reading that uh, provides us with, for thinking that um, the second analogy uh, proves the existence of particular causal laws. What about the problem with the strong reading? So the modest reading is wrong, I think, to think that in the second analogy uh, we can't really, um, in the second analogy, it's wrong to think that, it's wrong to defend that the second analogy doesn't give us the existence of particular law, the particular cause laws, or the argument doesn't guarantee the existence of particular cause laws. And the strong reading, I think, uh, commits a different um, crime. On the strong <laughs> reading, <laughs> um, the existence of particular cause laws guarantees the uniformity of nature. So uh, remember that for the Pierre's and Friedman, <coughs> um, the problem that Kant wants to solve in the second analogy is the problem of induction. And by proving the existence of such particular causal laws, Kant provides an a priori uh, conception of the informed of nature. I think <coughs> that even though particular causal laws guarantee the existence of type-type causal relationships, like you know, knowing that there will be uh, particular causal laws, 
will enable me to infer that there will be part-time causal relationships in the world. It doesn't really guarantee the repeatability of causal relations, those causal laws. <coughs> For, in other words, knowing that uh, nature is governed by particular causal laws um, is not sufficient to claim that that nature is uniform because those laws can be instant what Henry Ellison calls instantaneous laws that are instantiated only once. So Kant needs to show if he really wants to prove the uh, solve the problem of induction, Kant, in second analogy, also needs to show that those laws are repeatable, and yet he doesn't have the resources to do so in the second analogy. He, um, therefore, I think he fails to provide a, an a priori conception. Not that he fails, because I don't think he intends to provide such a priori conception, but um, that, that that in the second analogy, there is, uh, you can't really find um, sufficient resources to think that nature is uniform. Therefore, um, the problem with the strong reading is to think that Kant actually solves the problem of induction in the second analogy. I think, therefore, my alternative reading is that contra the modest reading, we should admit that the second analogy guarantees the existence of particular causal laws for the reasons that I've explained. Uh, but, contrary to strong reading, I think that the existence of particular cause laws does not establish the uniformity of nature. In nature, where all particular cause laws are instantiated only once, we can't really uh, talk about uniformity because there is no regularity. The laws are not repeatable. Uh, they're all instantaneous. So, Going to the strong reading, therefore, I don't think that Kant, the human problem that Kant wants to solve in the second analogy is the problem of induction. So, my reading then is that Kant's argument goes beyond solving the problem of causation because it also provides the, um, an a priori argument for the existence of particular causal laws, yet it falls short of solving the problem of induction because we don't really see. Uh, the uh, the prior conception of the uniformity of nature in that argument, for the reasons that I uh, explained, that the possibility of instantaneous laws, the um, laws being governed by non-repeatable empirical laws, um, undermine the fact that Kant um, has uh, Kant provides undermine the thesis that Kant has a a priori uh, conception of the so that is my alternative reading. I think it's a better one than both the modest and the strong readings because of the, you know, it uh, avoids the formation problems and explains um, how Kant can claim both that understanding is responsible for subsuming objects under empirical laws and that empirical laws cannot be discovered without the help of experience. Um, so that is all. I didn't really go into the detail of um, the model status of empirical laws, or I didn't really talk about them um, in this talk. Um, but if you have questions about that, about the necessity of the continuous of empirical laws, I'm uh, happy to answer those questions. So this is basically the end of my presentation. Thank you.
by moving our heads or moving around ourselves, we don't think the house is moving. And we're supposed to establish the difference, objective time order, by saying that there is a cause for the ship to be moving downstream. There isn't a cause operating in the house. Um, it seems to me that for me to be able to know that the ship is moving, and it's not just my head moving around, I have to have seen other ships, seen other things move, seen rivers work, lots of Lots of things. And if each of the laws here operated just once, this is my first ship, my first river, uh, or at least all the laws that held of past ships and rivers don't hold of this one, I'm not going to be able to do anything with knowing that the ship is moving instead of me moving things around. It doesn't seem to me that instantaneous laws. Might be even an oxymoron, mm -hmm. but even if it so either it's not tomorrow or maybe it's not oxymoron, but it doesn't help. So I think uh, I read the ship and house example very differently than you. I think that uh, in that example, Kant basically tries to um, illustrate the point that when we experience an event, we experience a determined temporal order that one event follows another in a determined in a necessary manner, while in the ship, in the house case, it's not determined. Right. Uh, so there must be something that determines that order. Is, is that otherwise we wouldn't be experiencing it as an event, as an object of succession. And that's something we don't know yet. That is, that is a rule, a particle causal law, as opposed to there is no particle causal law that determines the temporal or the dynamic experience of the object. So I don't think you have to actually experience, have prior experience to, um, to experience an event as an event. So I think Kant's point is that for you to experience that event as an event, you have to assume that there's a rule, a particle causal law, that determines that order. You have a um, you don't know what that rule is, a priori, but you have a reason, you have a, you should look for it. So, it's basically what Kant says, I think. Uh, it can be the existence of wind, it can be because there are angels that are pushing it, it can be some other thing that causes that. But what you know for sure is that for you to be able to experience that event as an event, there must be some cause. Only that. And what that particular causal cause is, is going to be determined, or is going to be known through experience once you, you know, make these observations and so on and so forth. So I think the point there is not that we apply the concept of cause only when we experience certain kind of regularities. It basically means that for us to able to, for us to be able to experience event as event, as determined order, we need to assume that there is a particular causal relationship, there is a particular causal law that determines it. And we don't know what that causal law is up here, but we have a reason to look for it. We know that there is that law up there. So that is the way I'm reading the second analogy argument, and that explains how <coughs> we can assume that there might be instantaneous causal laws. We don't really need to assume that they are, they are regular. And I think, in fact, um, from my subjective single instance, you know, uh, from, the, from a single case, from, a, from my analysis of my uh, experience in a single case, I'm not obviously justified to think that there are regularities out there. I think that would be what Lovejoy calls the uh, non sequitur of money grossness, right? From my uh, experience of the single um, ex event, I cannot assume that there are regular causal relationships. I wouldn't be justified in making that kind of inference. I think what I'm justified in is, is that if there's a determined temporal order, there must be a rule that determines it, and that rule is out there, it can be just instantaneous, instantaneous on once or more, more than once. I don't know. I don't know what that rule is, but I have a reason to look for it. 
just to kind of show you how to do it. It's a much different uh, and weaker. So first of all, that sounds like blue bell. Yes. I thought you were yeah. Right. yeah. Second, okay, clearly. But, but unlike Buchtel, I think that there are causal laws. You think the second now just shows Yeah, yeah. So <coughs> certainly nobody, not even Friedman wants to say that I know which causal laws are out there, and I don't want to say that. But the idea that whatever the causal laws are have nothing to do with ships and rivers and winds and so forth, that would disconnect the argument from the example. And the example is supposed to, it carries a lot of the power of the second analogy, whether or not. Yeah, I agree. So that they had to, it, presumably, whatever those laws are, they bear somehow on regularities such that there are other events that are like this. And that's quite important because otherwise, I don't actually know that there's an event there as opposed to when I look at the house. I mean, I can see the house is moving. I can move my head. Mm -hmm. You only need to, um, I think, for an event to be, in order for you to experience an event as an event as opposed to a specific object, you only need to assume that there must be a cause for it. That's why I think Kant is basically, um, talking about general, some general cause that we need to look for it. But we can't really um, re infer the existence of regularities from that inference. We can't really know that there must be a uniform cause for that event. I can only say that there is a uh, something that, a cause that determines the order in a particular way, but not that that causal relationship is going to be a regular one, or that it's a repeatable one, or that it's a uh, it's something that expresses a uniform causal relationship. And I think that is why I'm disagreeing with Friedman too. For Friedman, causation necessarily implies uniformity or regularity. I don't think that is the case. Causation for Kant, I mean, at least it seems to me that there is room for making this distinction. So for Kant, it seems that um, the rule that just determines an order is what we need to assume, you know, before us to, to distinguish object of succession from subject of but we don't know if that rule is going to be repeatable. That is mine. Yeah, so we have different readings, basically. But I think it mine is uh, consistent with the text. I think that the um, the example, the ship and house examples, serve a different purpose there. Just they just uh, illustrate the point that in, um, in experiencing events, we experience a determined tem uh, temporal, or, uh, temporal succession while when we experience an object, we don't uh, experience a determinate, but rather arbitrary uh, order of perceptual space. And that is the only role that they play. Yeah, uh, my question. <clears throat> What's wrong about the idea that the order of our perceptions are determined by an objective order which is it, which is determinate but totally un, undetermined by any law? Just like the fate of the slaves are determined by the arbitrary will of the masters. I think it's a conceptual fact that objective succession is a determinate and um, temporal order. When we talk about, I think for Kant, the distinction between objective succession and subjective succession refers to the distinction between uh, determinate versus arbitrary succession of um, perceptual states. And I think the ship and the uh, house example illustrates this point. In the house case, in our perception of the house, the order of perception is arbitrary. In the ship case, it is determined. And if it's determined, we have to explain why it's determined. We have to assume that there must be a determinant, something that determines it, that is a particular causal law. 
And that is that basically means that the objective succession is a succession which presupposes the existence of a particle in the wall. Yeah, but we're going to why. Why? Why determinants presupposes it's something determinants. So it seems that in a, in a sense, Kant is, uh, is your point that in a sense, Kant is already assuming that everything that is determined must have something that determines it, mm -hmm. and which is basically um, something that he needs to prove. The question to space is, what's wrong about that, that something determinant is determined by something non-determined? Something non-arbitrary can be determined by something arbitrary. Is that is there any conceptual we can read about that? Um, I don't understand the question. So, uh, can can you think of an example or quantum mechanics? If someone else Maybe. can <laughs> formally, huh? quantum mechanics, right? You might think that like the rules of quantum mechanics give you. Uh, a a non-determinate way to get determinate results. So you might have like some like general idea about what's going on, uh, some probabilistic determination. But there's not like a particular determinate rule that gives you every single individual result uh, by a procedure. But you will get a determinate result for all the cases that you check. Out. No, my question is different. <laughs> <laughs> My picture is that the objective order is determinant. But what's yes. wrong about that is that it, it's, it's, not not being a, it, it's not being determined. Right. It's arbitrarily determinant. Uh, that, that's the thing. If it's not right. determined by anything, why, do we, why is it determined? What is determining it? It seems like it's a conceptual mm -hmm. fact that it's determined, it must be determined by something else. Otherwise, it would be arbitrary. And we wouldn't be able to distinguish from arbitrary order of perceptual state. So we wouldn't be able to distinguish perception of events from perception of persistent objects. I agree with my question how Kant establishes that. Maybe I ask, ask a second, second question. Okay. What, uh, why, and in what sense is Kant's second energy and an energy? What is the second energy? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Not that the other one wasn't <laughs> I've been thinking a lot about, you know, um, analogical thinking, uh, thinking like, like um, it kind of inferences. So, for example, um, I'm going to use this as an example that he gave in the class, right? So uh, I observe a chair, it has a color, um, right? And it's, um, I experience the chair, it says, uh, this is orange. And then I observe another, ch I'll think of another chair. Then I, by analogy, by similarity, I can infer that it must have a color as well. I don't know a priori what that color is going to be, but I think that it must have a color. So I have a, I have reason to look for its color or to know its color, you know, empirically. Or another um, example that I gave, for example, was um, human beings, we make uh, products, artificial products, by using our reason. And Kant thinks that animals don't have reason. But animals also produce some products. And then from analogy, I can infer that they must have something close to reason, like something like instinct. So I know three facts. And from those three facts, I can infer the existence of another. Like I can infer the existence of instinct. I can infer the existence of uh, color for the chair that I, I don't know yet. But I have a reason to look for it, right? Because I'm making an inference. So in the second analogy, it seems to be that what Kant is doing is he is analyzing our experience of events. He says that when we experience an event, what we, um, 
what is special about experiencing an event is that the order of perceptual states is in a determinate order, and there's, a, there's something that determines it. We must assume that there's some cause. Similarly, when I experience a particular event, let's say the particular event, namely the ship moving downstream, I don't know the cause, the particular cause, but, but, but by analogy, I can infer that there must be a particular cause for it, or, or a particular rule that governs that event. I don't know what that rule is a priori, but I have a reason to look for it. And that is the kind of analogical inference that is, I think, going on here. So Kant basically says that every event presupposes some cause from which it follows in accordance with the rule. And when I experience a particular event, I must therefore look for this particular cause from which it follows. I don't know what that is going to be, but I need to look for it. So that is, I think, the analogical reasoning that is going on. So there is one human problem of causation and there's also a problem of induction. Both seem to be human problem and there's probably a third one that kind of correlates to your reading. Uh, then you said that Kant thinks of his own project as amplification of the human problem. Yeah. Which one of these do you think is the problem that is amplified? <laughs>
and yet at the same time have a priori validity. So Hume's argument against the causal principle, I think, woke him from his dogmatic slumber, made him realize that he needs to provide a different kind of um, a priori justification for these things. So I have a clarificatory question regarding what a repeatable law is. It's, it, it seems to me that like the atemporal nature of the law is just like part of what it is to be a law. If you like flip it on and off, it's not a law anymore. Do you mean like a repeatable law is one in, is one that has a range of events over which it regulates that includes more than one member? Is that what it is to be repeatable? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Because laws are basically, um, I mean, as I said, laws seems to uh, entail the existence of type type causal relationships, but we are not given any reason as to why we should think that there are more than one event tokens under those event types, right? It can be that under each um, law, there's only one event token that is in session. So um, I have a question about the overall position you end up with. So what's interesting about the contrast between the modest reading and the strong reading is that they end up picking out two different targets for what Kant might be up to in responding to Hume. One says it's a causal principle. Um, the other says it's more than it's the causal principle and more. It's the principle of induction. Um, and in each case, there's a reason for taking either the causal principle or the principle of induction or uniform of nature as being Kant's target. But then the position you end up uh, holding in the end is falls between the modest and the strong readings. Yeah. So Kant is doing more than responding to the, the causal principle, but he's not going so far as responding to the uniformity of nature. Yeah. Um, and then it looks like Kant really isn't responding to Hume, or is he? So mm -hmm. it's an invitation to try to clarify what this tells us about Kant's relationship to Hume. Yeah, I think he's still responding to Hume, but not, um, I think it's, um, wrong to first set the goal for Kant's argument and then try to fit the argument according to that goal. Instead, I mean, my strategy was trying to read the argument itself and what it establishes. And it seems that, I mean, even though Kant has Hume in mind while writing that argument, uh, he, um, it's not that, um, has you know this very limited problem that he has in mind. So and also for Kant, causation is, um, is by definition rule governed, unlike for Hume it seems. Um, so so my my answer then is I think Kant in the second analogy still aims to respond to Hume, but not either of these particular problems. Um, it's just that generally he wants to uh, show that that Hume is basically wrong to think that we know about causal relationships after we experience regularities in nature. We are we have to assume that there that there are causal relations in order to be able to have experience. So um, in the second analogy, there's a passage where he says that what I've argued so far seems to be in contradiction with, with uh, what people used to think, and he seems to describe Hume's position there, that, you know, how, um, maybe I find it, <laughs> uh, that's how uh, the concept of causation, um, and the rule that it provides is, uh, is an a priori, it's an empirical 
concept and empirical rule, and he basically, he generally wants to show that it's not an empirical rule, it's an a priori rule, but that rule entails a quantitative causal loss. So in a, in a way, he responds to him, but he does a little bit more than he needs to you know, to respond to him because of his uh, commitment to the fact that causation is rule governed necessary connection for him. Well, okay, so this goes maybe back to raise this question. Right? So, what is the problem uh, of causation according to Kant? It sounds like, because you had quotes at the beginning in which Kant says, I've solved the problem, right? And then the second analogy, um, he does more than solve the problem, he gets particular yeah. causal laws yeah. as well, but he solved the problem. So, does Kant yeah. think that, that every event has a cause, the causal principle is the problem? Uh, or, or does he also see the problem of induction as a as a serious problem? And, and one of the reasons for worrying about that is that whatever access Kant might have had to the treatise, he did have access to the inquiry, and that's where Hume is focusing on the problem of induction. So if he's not, if he doesn't have anything to say about induction, um, has he really responded to Hume? So that's um, okay. So I think um, Kant doesn't really Kant is not really interested in inductive inferences. It seems to be seems to me that he is on board with you that inductive inferences can at most give us comparatively universal generalizations. You know, he actually makes a distinction between strict universality and comparative universality, and he seems to suggest that. The inductive inferences that most tells us that this and this has been like that so far, but not that it's going to be in the future. So he seems to be on board with you that um, that induction is not the kind of inference that can give us strict universal uh, um, principles. So that's why he doesn't really need to even provide an a priori conception of the importance of nature. If for him, if he wanted to really um, um, to show that um, inductive inferences are valid inferences, he wouldn't really admit that inductive inferences are the inferences that can give us you know, the comparative universal generalizations that are contingent generalizations. It seems that he basically introductions or something like that. Um, and also whenever Kant talks about Hume, he <coughs> talks about causation, the concept of causation and the, uh, the, the causal principle. He thinks that Hume focused on this single metaphysical principle and a single metaphysical concept, namely the concept of causation and the causal principle. In the Prolegomena, he refers to these principles by name. But he never really talks about the principle of the uniformity of nature. And he never really brings up the issue of principle uh, the uniformity of nature. Um, so I think for him, inductive reasoning is just this kind of reasoning that he would agree with. That the reasoning that gives us certain kind of judgments, contingent judgments, compared to universal judgments. So that's why I don't think he actually Everything has to uh, provide it. Doesn't yeah? this raise the truth about the modality of particular and empirical laws? And, and if we learn that particular <coughs> generalizations merely through experience, then are they really laws? Because laws have to have necessity. when they are uh, placed in a system of laws. I mean, the third critique can't um, explain how we become uh, conscious or you know, we know that they are necessary when they express necessity in a system of laws. So what we can know in the first critique is that there are necessary laws out there, but we cannot really know if the law that we discovered right now, this individual law, is a necessary law. 
We can only know that it's a necessary law if it's in a system, it's a system of empirical laws, if it's in a theory, for example. And so, so in a sense, they, those empirical laws express a kind of necessity in a system. And we know that there are necessary laws out there, but we don't know if we are going to get the you know, match between that. So that's actually criti criticism that uh, some scholars like uh, Rolf Walker come up with. Kant seems to think, Kant seems to argue that there are laws out there, but he never says that this is a law or that this is a necessary law. We just have to. Um, we can only be conscious or think that they express a kind of necessity in a system, but still we will not be ensured of their necessity in the strong, stronger sense of necessity. See. So there are different kinds of necessities, I think, and um, uh, and that is also a, a problem with both the modest and the strong readings. I think that they both of these readings focus on different kinds of necessity. The weak reading focus on the necessity of the empirical laws that when they express a necessity in a system of laws, they deny that laws express any kind of necessity other than that. And uh, strong reading says that all the, the necessity of laws is grounded in the understanding. And it's basically the only kind of necessity that they express is due to um, due to the relationship they have to more general laws of nature. So I want to say that for Kant, no, it seems that it's more complicated. It seems to allow for both kinds of necessity. Yeah, so that's my position. Is it possible that Kant is setting the stage for modern deductive science in that he is eliminating the talk about uh, empirical laws mm -hmm. and simply saying they exist, we're familiar with them. Yeah. Uh, he's following Newton by a certain number of years. You have uh, mechanics coming in place. There must be other things around there. Uh, we don't see E and M yet until the next century. And so he's saying, can we build a deductive principle, causal principle, that actually explains these uh, empirical principles? And that's his, his um, uh, reason for being in this particular thesis. Uh, what, what do you mean by deductive principle? Well, if you look at, in my sense, if uh -huh. you're going to build, as a scientist, you're going to build a series of, or base your stuff on a series of empirical laws, yeah. the inductions and such, but if you're, you're going to create a hypothesis and you're going to create a theory after mm -hmm. that, yeah. and uh, since, uh, since Newton's time, mm -hmm. theories have developed mathematically very persistently, and we have at this time, really a dependence upon a causal principle. Most people will accept that, and almost it's almost within our discussions. Mm -hmm. We, oh yeah, it's here, and we, we, we accept, expect that, but it, in 17, 1800, that doesn't exist yet. And Kant is asking or trying to reach out to say something about that principle that it should exist, and we have taken that principle and run with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's compatible with what, what I say, that he is actually uh, the strong reading, the defenders of strong reading, for example, read Kant as um, trying to provide a groundwork, a foundation for Newtonian science, mm -hmm. basically, um, and that providing that kind of a priori basis at the, the general level provides the so scientist a kind of guide. Right. He doesn't have to talk about yeah. the inductive. He's free to do that because it is part of the ethos of that time, in our time as well. But he has, he wants to step forward, and he, he presages a, uh, a new time. Yeah. That kind of uh, uh, allows science to be more than uh, mere inductive generalizations, exactly. provides on some ground for, for the. Unfortunately, his critique of reason is that being deductive, you have to be reasonable. And so you have to use deduction and reason. I mean, he's, isn't he criticizing that? Um, I don't think he criticizes deductive methods. No, not deductive methods. OK. But he, you said earlier that the, the, the topic, the, the, the title critique of reason, mm -hmm. is that you, uh, you can't develop things uh, deductively. But we tend to do that in terms of theories. I see. I, what I meant to say is that 
you can't um, say anything informative about the world purely deductively. You have to appeal to the possible experience in order to say something informative about the world. Otherwise, you will just be analyzing concepts and clarifying them. <laughs> and that is consistent with, you know, and, and that way you can have consistent, uh, you know, metaphysics that have completely different views of the world. Right. Um, I've seen completely different things about the world based on the starting point. Yeah? Um, okay, this is this is a completely ignorant question, so excuse the if the, the answer is quick. Mm -hmm. um, so with for the weak reading, I guess the problem that uh, you're pointing out is that you know they focus on the uh, you know general co co uh, the causal principle, and uh, then they deny that Kant is up to um, you know proving the existence of particular cause of laws. Now I'm wondering what commits the weak uh, people, like you know, the proponents of the weak reading, to that, uh, to that, I mean it doesn't yeah. seem like it follows and you know it just seems like a peculiarity of their reading maybe or something like that but mm -hmm. it doesn't seem inconsistent for them to... So what the, so actually the weak reading um, basically allows the, the, the time to say that, look, Kant had this modest, modest goal and he accomplished it. Kant was not interested in um, proving the existence of particular cause and law. And both the modest reading and the strong reading assume that by laws must be regular and uniform. So I am basically arguing that laws do not have to be uh, regular, do not have to be uniform. That can be instantaneous laws. And, um, and uh, the reason why the, the defenders of the reading don't want to say that in the second analogy Kant proves the existence of laws is because they think that Kant would be committing a secretary of numbing grass, non secretary of numbing grass, like a policy. Tal uh, um, by claiming that by my analysis of this my individual experience, I can infer the existence of some regularity out in the world, which seems to be a false inference, right? Um, so Friedman acknowledges the fact that if you go with the big reading, you don't have to um, argue that, you know, you don't have to make this inference from particular instance of your experience to the existence of regularities out there, and there's the laws out there that are governing, you know, similar types of events. Um, so that is their motivation to, um, to actually respond to the Lawjoy and Strawson's critique of Kant's argument for making that kind of policy, for limiting itself to non secretary of non Brussels. They say, look, Kant did not really want to prove the existence of regularities or uniformities in nature based on our experience of these single individual events. Mm -hmm. He couldn't do that. He was just interested in proving that every event must have some cause. His argument is, has no, um, he did not have intention to, uh, any intention to prove the, particle, the existence of particular cause and loss. So that is basically their motivation. And Friedman admits that, you know, how the weak, weak reading allows them to sidestep the, that criticism by a lot of Quick follow up. Uh, so is the, is the worry there that I mean, the thing that they want to deny, is it the claim that there are particular, uh, by they, I mean the uh, proponents of the weak reading, mm -hmm. against like charges uh, of the strong readers, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, is the claim that they want to uh, uh, deny that the, you know, the existence of a particular cause of laws, or, uh, you know, the, the the particular laws that you come up with. Um, I mean, so it seems like if, if the particular laws is what they, what the, you know, the, the opponent would be um, accusing the weak readers of kind of building into the second analogy, 
then that seems like a good objection. But if all the you know the weak readers are said would I mean they, they don't say it apparently, but if they were to say okay, I, Kant establishes the uh, validity of the um, causal principle, okay, and also that's consistent with him um, also establishing the you know existence of particular laws. If they claim that, right, it doesn't seem like the, I mean so I basically. Okay, maybe I didn't even understand what you said, but it seems like you know the opponent couldn't come back and say, um, you know, uh, the the existence of particular causal laws that you see Kant, uh, you know, uh, developing in the second critique is like uh, not so good of the of uh, numbing grossness or something like that. I don't know. Did that even make sense? Um, Sorry, if it doesn't, <laughs> just let me move on. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the movie later. I have a question about sort of your positive or your understanding of Kant's positive argument in psychoanalogy. Mm -hmm. And so your reading differs from Sam's in that on your reading, in order to experience an event, you have to presuppose that it had some cause, right? Yeah. That's basically the, the gist of the argument. Um, but, but that doesn't really seem to you know, show the causal principle, which isn't about my experience of events, it's just about events themselves. Um, so, it, 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 this, Kant doesn't really respond directly to Hume's actual argument for why the causal principle doesn't hold. He sort of is just giving another argument in support of. Uh, do you see what I'm asking? Um, so Hume um, thought that we can't. Um, so Hume thought that we can't really prove that every event has some cause. It's a necessary principle, basically, right? and it's not a priori. We can't know it a priori, and he showed it by showing. You know, my argument that I can imagine there being an event without a cause, therefore these concepts are separable from each other, and therefore, you know, there is no necessary connection. I can it doesn't have to be the case that every event is something that's not just about. And Kant says, look, you can't really experience an event as an event unless you assume that there is a something there's a rule or something that determines your perceptual state that constitutes that event in a particular way, <coughs> in a determined way, irreversible way. So he says to him, basically, you can't really get that causal principle from experience. It can't be known through experience because you have to assume its validity in order to be able to even have experience of events. So that is the way that he responds to it. And that explains how it's an a priori principle. And yet, the concept of event and the concept of cause are, um, are not conceptually contained in each other. Um, it just, uh, it's just a fact about our experience of events that makes reference to causes. And the, you know, the transcendental idealist principle that the conditions for the possibility of experience are the conditions for the possibility of objects kind of explains how the subjective condition of me to have an experience of event can have an objective validity. It actually uh, shows how this is an objectively valid principle, non a priori and yet synthetic at the same time. Thanks, that was fun. why you might be right that he's not interested in, that Kant's not interested in induction and reasons why he might be wrong. One of the one of sec seconds just occurred to me. So in support of what you said, and you say this last presentation, 
is the very fact that kind of seems to take up something that looks like issues about induction into the first introduction, in the introductions to the to judgment and uh, in the transcendental dialectic, and that suggests that he's not interested in, in this context, so that's good. But on the other hand, Hume's skeptical skepticism doesn't really show up in the claim that there might be events without causes. It shows up when he says that there is no need for regularities across nature. And Kant, not only does it seem much more likely just intuitively that what shocked Kant so much woke him from the dogmatic mm -hmm. problems as the doubts about induction, but this is a crucial thing textually. Hume's solution that Kant criticizes to his own problem, whatever the problem is, a subjective necessity solution to happen. That's a solution for the problem about induction. It is not a solution to the question, which isn't necessarily even a problem for Kant, but Hume, about the causal principle. That is, Hume suggests in response to his own problem about induction, well, yes, there are regularities in nature insofar as we have habits of expecting them, or rather, there aren't any real regularities maybe, but we still have those habits. And Kant says that's no answer. And he does pick that up repeatedly and say that's not an answer, you do something else with an answer. So he's picking up what he picks up as the answer to what he kind of thinks as Hume's problem is an answer to the problem that invention. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Hume is Independently of 
first proving that there are regularities. That would be an empiric empiricist method of you know, trying to account for causal necessity by showing that, look, you know, we, because we need regularity only to, be, to, um, to have that kind of uh, subjective feeling. Right? But we don't really need uh, regularity to, to assume that there are regularities or uniformities in nature to be able to think that there are things in the world that follows from each other in a necessary manner, and in an irreversible manner, and things like that. So that's all. Yes. I think those so are two separate issues. The conceptual 
conceptual point would be could there be a And the reason I think that I'm inclined to take that seriously when thinking about it is how strong it distinguishes